So, we pick up our story at the end of Pearl Harbor. A complete success, we are now looking at the zenith of the Japanese Empire. And they are controlling a massive portion of territory throughout the Pacific. This is under their control, which is really their long-term strategic interest. This was the whole goal of taking out the American forward base. And we talked about their objectives last week, and in many respects they met those very, very clearly. So what is their 1942 strategy? What is Japan looking to accomplish here? Well, remember, their traditional enemy is Russia. Russia is their traditional enemy, and at this time, Germany is winning. Germany is destroying Russia quite vehemently. So they're looking to capitalize on this. Did they expect to fully keep the United States out of war? No, they didn't. But they thought if they had a six to 12 month head start, they could dominate the Pacific where the United States could not catch up. So this was their 1942 strategy. And on New Year's Eve, they're looking pretty good. Page 260 in your book, students, is really outlines what their conquest was. And you look at the, really, the, the Blitzkrieg of Japan. They were committing Blitzkrieg in the South Pacific. And George will talk a bit more extensively about this tonight, but expelling the British from what we now know as Malaysia. Securing East Timor, particularly the oil supplies. Because remember, that was one of the reasons Japan felt combined, compelled to go into this war. They could not secure oil, and this would happen. Evicting the United States from Wake Guam in the Philippines. I had a gentleman come up to me yesterday, Philip Margulies. He's a gentleman I know at uh, Unitarian Church. He's 90 years old, and he proceeded to lecture me quite correctly. Um, this war was actually an extension of the 1898 Spanish-American War, and he really laid a good foundation there, and I really applaud him, Phil. It was his birthday, I was hardly going to argue with him. And no need to argue with someone who was correct, and he was spot on correct. And we look at Wake Guam in the Philippines, and these were colonies that the United States obtained in 1898. Japan sought to oust them from this region. We know the Philippines campaign, rather infamous in our country's history, and the Japanese regulars, while they were frankly outnumbered, they were much more experienced, and they overran the islands rather easily. Now, the islands, because the Philippines is a chain of hundreds of islands, and at this time, and probably even similar to today, but more so at this time, often warfare was a series of capture the flag or capture the capital. President Roosevelt would order General MacArthur to retreat to Australia. And he would do this reluctantly, but indeed MacArthur would retreat. The troops would, would withdraw into a defensive position. And when you look at the Bataan Peninsula, it's a peninsula of one of the main islands, and they were there in a defensive position really to hold out until MacArthur or someone could return with proper reinforcements. Well, unfortunately that return would not come quick enough or fast enough, and many of us have read of, of the Bataan Death March. In a nutshell, again, it is a forcible transfer, a march across the peninsula. And while we do focus on the Americans quite extensively, remember, we were one-fifth of the population that were being marched. And every account of this journey is just as gruesome as it sounds, thinking of the weather conditions, the humidity, the lack of water, lack of food, disease, and keep up or suffer the consequences. This would be used quite effectively back home in propaganda. Kind of, I think it's uh, wrong to allow us to think that Germans had the market cornered on propaganda. Now, it, it far predates the Germans, certainly a very effective use in 2012. But these are the type of recruiting posters that were issued. Needless to say, we're angry. We're damn angry about this. We know word trickles back to what happened. <clears throat> and this Bataan Death March will not go unanswered. We're going to send our best. <clears throat> a 
I'm not sure who's a better general. I might go with John Wayne, but I think highly of MacArthur as well. And we would see many of these type of movies that would come out after the war. I'd like to kind of share with you what a modern day legacy is of the Bataan Death March. Uh, again, we're familiar with it historically. Well, it, it maintains a modern day legacy. The state of New Mexico lost approximately half of all the marchers on that. Many, many of the soldiers were from New Mexico. And thus, for the last 27 years at White Sands Missile Base in New Mexico, they have held a memorial march, a commemorative reenactment of this. I had the privilege to participate in this in 1997 and in 1999. Uh, we start at 6 a.m. in the morning at the uh, missile base. A uh, question, sir? Did you go heavy or did you go light? I'm a civilian, sir. I went light. He's talking about did I carry a heavy pack or not? And certainly not, although I might argue that carrying myself around could be a heavy pack, sir. <laughs> but I had the opportunity to participate two different times. Uh, we were starting out at 6 a.m. in the morning. Uh, in 1997, there were seven survivors there that gave us a very inspirational talk. And when they told us about what their day entailed and what their march was, suddenly the 26 mile march that I was facing was much less daunting. It really was. That being said, New Mexico in late April is pretty hot. Starting at 6 a.m., most of us got done somewhere around uh, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. And thus it was a forced march through, uh, throughout the base in a reenactment, you really felt quite humble doing this. And like I said, uh, as difficult as this was, the many blisters and bruises that I had, um, I think that it was much easier, certainly, than the original here. Chris, is this something you ever had a chance to participate in? Yes, I think I went in. Well, we'll fix that. I'll take the microphone. We'd love to hear your story real quickly about this. I was stationed at Fort Irwin, California, and we had the opportunity as a small group to travel to uh, New Mexico to participate in this. At that point in time, I was pretty young and didn't know a whole lot about the history behind this, but being a pretty athletic individual, at least back in the day, I decided to participate in this. Essentially, I signed up for the heavy team, meaning we trained for weeks ahead of time to uh, go with, I think it was either a 40 or 45 pound pack in the regular military uniform, which would have been boots and camouflage pants and gloves. Uh, it was a pretty humbling experience. I, I was in pretty good shape at the time, but if I was mile 20 or so, you get off, off of that hill and you hit that sand and I just came to a complete crawl. It was, uh, it was very difficult. Thanks for sharing that. So again, the legacy does live on today, that's for sure. We look at the Battle of Midway. This was the first, you know, again, a huge carrier battle. And you really can't call Pearl Harbor a carrier battle necessarily since our carriers were out at sea and not really engaged in this. So this would be a strategic carrier battle, uh, obviously involving Japanese strength. They were just at the very apex of their military ability. This was their time to shine, their time to put the final touches on the American Navy. And we're going to ask John to come up real quick. John Stevens uh, brought here a couple of planes and he asked him to sort of share a little bit about what these planes are and how they factored into this Midway Carrier Battle. 